Everybody, it's Tyler here at the championship checking team number 254. The Cheesy Poos is team ranked number one of the FRC top 25. And what an incredible machine, 254, coming back and just building fantastic machines every single year. Uh, we're going to be doing a full system overview on this robot, of course, talking about the mechanical aspects and programming aspects as well, too. Uh, now, let me speak more about this incredible machine I have proud of and Shonic. And 254, legendary team. You gotta find out what goes in this robot. A couple new things this year, too, coming up on Behind the Bumpers. Your destination for first content, updates, and gaming. Welcome, Welcome to, to the fun. fun. First updates now, supported by Stryker Careers. If you are a college student or recent graduate looking for an incredible internship, take a look at Stryker. Stryker provides a housing stipend, great pay, and an opportunity to work with state-of-the-art medical technology equipment. Discover why so many first alumni are coming to Stryker for their internship or career at careers.stryker.com. First updates now, supported by Kettering University. Kettering University hosts three co-op employment fairs each year for incoming and current students. Participating in the co-op employment process at Kettering is a great way to begin turning robotics experience into a professional career to earn money towards graduating debt-free. If you are a senior, it's not too late to apply at kettering.edu slash apply. So let's start out on your drive base. Uh, walk me through that, and then we'll start going through your uh, cargo path as well. Yeah, sure. So I guess the biggest, most striking feature of our drive base that a lot of teams have noticed is the swerve. So this is the first year, this is the first year in our team's 22 year history that we've done swerve on a competition robot. Yeah. And so we decided to go with the uh, Swerve Drive Specialties Mark IV inverted modules and they've been working out great for us. So I gotta ask, what was the impetus behind that decision? Because 254 has always been hard on the eight. Tank drives are okay, we don't need to go swerve. What made that change this year? Yeah, so coming into the season, we kind of had an idea that depending on the game, maybe we want to try swerve. And you know, this is a big open field, no bumps to drive over. Yeah. And so we figured this is the perfect game uh, to do a swerve drive base. Yeah, and obviously you've been paying off great dividends for your for your team yeah. as well too on that. Uh, let's start to follow that uh, cargo journey. You got the awesome dual intake on it. Uh, so tell me about uh, not just what it is, but like any iterations your team might've had. And then love to hear more about the material on your rollers as well too. Yeah, sure. So. Uh, I guess one of the things first is this is our fifth version of the intake. Sure. And so throughout the season, we've been testing different designs, seeing what works. Our original design had flex wheels instead of this roller, but you know, due to weight reasons, we had to find a different solution. And so one thing we found was that this grip tape works really well through testing. We tested different materials. And so we decided to just stick this grip tape on a polycarbonate roller. Yeah. And that's super lightweight. We saved a few pounds on each intake and it still works great. Yeah, I mean, we've seen a couple of our teams that have said they've taken inspiration from your team on this type of material. Yeah. Uh, so that's really cool. And you'll, you'll see, uh, as we go through this robot, different parts have that same material as yeah, well, too. Yeah, basically the entire ball pad is covered in this grip tape. Yeah, so very cool. So uh, so as we come in, uh, as the cargo piece comes in, we go into uh, in, kind of indexer type area for that. Talk to me more about that, and we'll lead into your shooter. Yeah, sure. And we can actually give a demonstration Yeah, let's take a well. look. What color? All right. It'll reject red? OK. Yeah, and so let's intake a ball here. Yeah, and so as you can see, our intakes were great to pick up balls. We can pick up from anywhere along the intake. And then these wheels over here help to center the ball into the serializer. Um, we're kind of moving into the serializer. Uh, one of the cool features of the serializer is that we have a bunch of sensors to kind of help our robot be in the optimal state um, that we want it to be in. And Seanic will kind of talk more about that when we get into the software. Um, but yeah, our serializer is capable of holding three balls. We can hold a ball at, on either side, and we can hold a ball in the center to feed it into the shooter. Um, from the, from the mechanicals on your serializer here, you got the uh, two pieces of uh, what looks like a 3D printed part that's kind of yeah. arcing in. Can you talk to me a little bit more about what that is? Yeah, sure. So in order to be able to store these balls and have the shooter right above, uh, what we came up with for feeding the balls into the shooter is this slightly ramped profile paired with the surgical tubing. And so actually what happens is the surgical tubing, as the ball rides up onto the tubing, it's flexible enough to kind of push out of the way and then underneath the ball. 
And then it's what pushes the, lifts the ball into the shooter. Sure. As we go into the shooter then, I uh, obviously have a lot of pre-fire wheels as it's coming in uh, on this. I'd love to hear a couple things. One, uh, you're one of the few teams that has, a, a, I'd say, a flywheel this big uh, yeah. that we've seen before. So how's that been working out for you? Uh, and then, uh, you know, we'll go into the mechanics and a lot to talk about, I know, from software a little bit later. Yeah, sure. So for the shooter this year, our original shooter had much smaller fair lane wheels. But what we found was that it wasn't great at shooting consistently um, through different types of balls. And so we swapped to this super large nine inch diameter billet flywheel. Yeah. And what that gives us is a, long, uh, is a long acceleration time. And that allows us to shoot the balls consistently, no matter what state they're in, how inflated they are. In addition to that, we also added these rollers back here. And these have a surface speed match to the uh, flywheel. And so that shoots the ball with no spin almost. Yep. And through testing, we found that that's what worked best um, for an accurate shot that doesn't bounce out. So we've seen 254 uh, shoot all over the field for things, but where, like, if you have a preference of where to shoot from, is there a certain spot on the field that you like? Yeah, usually right at the edge of the tarmac, yeah. the tape line. So, That's where we try to take most of our shots. Uh, and then for material on, like, uh, we'll talk about Limelight and Vision a little bit, but, like, just the material, the, the 3D printing and the carbon fiber sort of thing, like, uh, is there anything in particular for this type of route versus, like, you know, I'm just more building, like, standard aluminum structure or anything like that? Yeah, so I mentioned before that we had some issues with weight on our robot. Okay. And so using carbon fiber rods was an easy, lightweight solution. Yeah. Makes sense. Uh, let's uh, go into your climber uh, yeah, sure. next on here too. Obviously a phenomenal uh, climber for that. Uh, I know uh, we'll talk a little bit about climb sequence and show that off as well. Uh, and then just love to hear what's gone into it and uh, any uh, any other ideas that maybe 254 tested before going to this one. Yeah, sure. So going into the season when we looked at the climb, we knew that we needed to have a fast, consistent climb to be able to rank well and win regionals and the championships, hopefully. Yep. And so in order to do that, we decided to skip the third rung. And so we go directly from the second or mid rung all the way to the fourth traversal bar. And so this is how we decided to do that. So here. Um, so why don't we demonstrate the climb now? And, and we can talk about it as it kind of goes through each spot, like yeah, walk us through uh, each Let's sequence. eject the ball first, Johnny. Let's eject the ball. Yeah, and so that's another cool feature is we can eject the balls if we need to. Sure. Yeah, so starting off on the climb on this side. Um, yeah, so the first step in our climb is to we use this carriage to latch onto the middle, the level two bar. And from there, we are able to pull down. And as we pull down, this bar here reacts against the underside of the truss. And so if you kind of imagine it as the robot, as the robot pulls up, and this is reacting against the underside of the truss. Gotcha. It serves as a, like a secondary pivot point and makes our robot completely flat and square up against the truss. And that allows us to reach all the way to the traversal rung with the stinger is what we call it. And that's just barely within uh, the extension and height yeah, limits. Yeah, right. So when, uh, as mentioned, like when you're looking at other concepts, where were there any other concepts that you tried that maybe uh, weren't quite compatible with what you're looking for before you came up with this? Yeah, so one of the original concepts we had was more akin to the 125 climb, sure. where instead of reacting against the truss, you react against the high the bar high rung, and yeah. use that to flatten your robot out. But uh, there were a few issues with that. One of the biggest ones was that the um, the reaction against the high rung would have had to have a large swept uh, area in our robot and sure. that would have taken up a large space claim which wasn't ideal in addition um, because we re kind of climb underneath the truss we're able to sneak a third robot on the rung potentially and so this opens the door for a triple traversal climb so looking at championships here is that from a strategy standpoint 254 do you think that's a viable strategy that might might happen with uh, your alliance yeah definitely and actually we've already seen it happen before uh, we did two successful triple traversal climbs at SBR. Yep. So it, it looked awesome uh, as well, too, with that. So uh, let's keep moving on. Let's head over to more of the programming uh, side sure. of things. So, uh, Sean, tell us more about uh, sensors that's gone into it. Uh, and, of course, anything we can demonstrate would be fantastic, too. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so in the serializer area, we have uh, three beam break sensors. And they're positioned specifically so we can know exactly how many balls are in that robot just by the number of uh, beam break sensors that are triggered. So they're positioned almost exactly a one ball width apart. So in addition to that, we have two rev color sensors. 
And the story of our, of our color sensors is an interesting one. So we started off by using these uh, Wengler industrial color sensors, which outputted two DIO ports uh, for whether we detected red and whether we detected blue. Um, but later on, we decided that we didn't like these sensors, uh, primarily because they were a little annoying to calibrate and they weren't as accurate uh, as we liked it to be. So we decided to switch to these rev color sensors and we positioned them closer to the center of the serializer. So these rev color sensors, we decided not to wire to the standard I2C port on the Roborio since we found that some teams had issues with that port. So what we actually did was we wired up the sensors to a TNC microcontroller and we have code on that microcontroller that reads the ITC signal from the rev color sensors. And for each sensor, it outputs a value that is the ratio between the red and the blue detected by that sensor. So sure. that's what we found was the best output. And this output is a PWM signal, and we read it through a DIO port on the Roborio using a synchronous interrupt. So we read the falling and the uh, the falling and the rising timestamps of the of that PWM signal. And since we know the length of an entire duty cycle, we can find, using that ratio, we can find the PWM output. So that output tells us the ratio between the red and blue, like I said. And based on that, we can determine if that sensor sees a red ball, a blue ball, or nothing. So this plays a big part into our, our serializer state machine. And the, I think my favorite part of this is that no matter what state we're in, whether we're intaking, shooting, an autonomous teleop, or any combination of uh, what I mentioned, it'll eject a ball uh, if, it's a, if it, the color sensor sees an incorrect ball. And the way we eject is that uh, we want to move all the incorrect balls to our side of the field. Okay. So that makes it harder for the uh, opposing alliance to pick them up. So are you actually ejecting through your shooter then, or is it coming back through your, your uh, intake? Yeah, so we decided, um, our initial plan was to have them ejected through the intake, um, but we decided, we decided against that because we want to we want to spend all of that intake time to be able to intake balls. So yeah. if we're ejecting an incorrect color ball, we can still pick up a correct color ball. So we eject uh, using, uh, we eject through the shooter. And the, uh, the, we have a different uh, eject sequence depending on where we are on the field. So, but generally, the goal is to put that incorrect ball onto our side of the field while also offsetting the turret so we don't accidentally score. So you said based on where you are on the field, I'm assuming that's all automated that says, like, you know, your robot knows where you are on the field and it's doing a certain amount of power for ejection or do you have to manually set something like that? Uh, yeah, so we use our robot's odometry to determine where we are on the field. Uh, and we have uh, a map that maps uh, the distance from the close side of the field sure. uh, to the specific RPM that we, we want to eject at. And then for, you mentioned odometry on your robot. How are you uh, accommodating for drift on your robot uh, during a match as well? Are you using like the limelight to kind of redetect where you are? Or how do you, how do you correct for that odometry uh, drift errors? Uh, yeah, so as we mentioned, uh, we do use uh, vision in our odometry. So uh, the, the data we use from our limelight uh, are the corners that it returns to us. Gotcha. And those corners, uh, because of the shape of the vision target, uh, are in the shape of an arc. And we use the top of the arc in the math that we use that converts uh, that location, uh, that pixel coordinate in the limelight image to uh, a pose, that, uh, a pose that's the pose between our robot and the vision target. And we integrate that into our odometry to get a more accurate reading based on our vision. So as we start to wrap up on this robot here, let's kind of just follow uh, that full journey. Talk to us about the uh, color sensor uh, and then uh, anything else we want to wrap up with as well. Yeah, sure. So let's start off by taking a red ball. And so one of the cool things is, as you can see, if we want to intake based on which side we want to intake from, the red ball kind of shuffles, and so that allows us to always have a clear path to the shooter. Yeah. So if we intake a wrong color ball, we have the ability to automatically eject it, even if we already have another color ball in the robot. That's really cool. Well, love it. I, I just love the whole thing that, it, like, depending on where you're on the field is, like, how much RPM is going to crank through and that sort of thing. Yeah. And let's talk about uh, vision tracking on your robot as well, and we'll start to wrap up. Yeah, sure. So our robot uh, aims at the target using a limelight. And so, as you can see, it's able to vary the turret angle, the shooter RPMs, and the hood angle, all based on what it sees from the vision target. Well... 254 Cheesy Poofs, phenomenal machines every single year, and we appreciate the insight uh, that you provide on this robot. Hopefully a great thing for teams to uh, use as a resource and learn as well, too. So, of course, wish you best of luck here Thank at Championships, you. and I uh, can't wait to see how you do it. Thanks a lot for taking the time. Of course. Thanks to Kettering University for their support of this video.
Did you know that over 30% of the student population at Kettering University was in high school robotics? These same students have received a portion of over $7 million in robotics scholarships from Kettering University. See why so many in first chose to go to Kettering University at Kettering.edu. Thanks to Stryker Careers for their support in this video. Apply the skills you gained as a first student or mentor and help change the world at Stryker. Stryker is the top career choice for many of those in first because of their commitment to innovation and saving lives. Learn more about the incredible culture at Stryker and view their thousands of positions available around the world at careers.stryker.com. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and ring the bell to stay up to date on our new videos. Keep the conversation going and provide your input to our content. Watch our live shows at twitch.tv forward slash first updates now. Join our Discord at discord.gg forward slash first updates now. And check out Fun FTC on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And First Updates Now on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, and Twitter.